you know, uh, I just wanted to see. It's interesting when we start broadcasting, uh, the slideshow stops each time, it looks like. So I have to stop share. Oh, and, I yeah. can start. I'll just no, do that we're, on my we're end. Good. We're good. We got her. We're okay. up and running, and people are joining us. Looks good. All righty. For those of you that are filing into our webinar, welcome. This is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. We've been doing a series of webinars for a few weeks now, and we appreciate those of you that uh, are just joining us for the first time and those of you that have uh, seen many of our webinars. Keep in mind that these webinars are being recorded and will be available on YouTube for a short period of time. Uh, we've done that just in case, uh, you know, it didn't work out for you to see the webinars live. Uh, we will be issuing CE credit. Your CE credit will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. You will not receive CE credit from the Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Your CE credit will arrive to the email address you registered with um, to get on this webinar. Just a big thank you to the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry for putting together today's uh, program of speakers. Uh, yesterday, we had the International Academy of Nathology that put together three speakers for us. And this Thursday, the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics has put together uh, three speakers as well. Uh, lots of CE remaining this week. For next week, we don't have our CE offerings up yet. We're just trying to figure out uh, what are going to be the best webinars to do uh, now that uh, Washington State dentists will be going back May 18th. So we're just uh, game planning some things uh, there. So uh, if you're interested to see what our CE offerings are for next week, go to WashingtonAGD.org. Once we have those uh, webinars up and running uh, or up and scheduled, you'll be able to register for them. Um, you will see flyers going by of some of our past webinars. That's just a reminder of what is available at YouTube. So to get to those uh, webinars, go to YouTube and search for Washington Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, or you can go to our webpage, WashingtonAGD.org, and then click on the YouTube link there. When you're on YouTube, remember to like, subscribe, and click the bell, and you'll be notified every time there's a new webinar available uh, to you on, web, uh, on YouTube. Um, we'd like to thank all our sponsors. We, we have the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the University of Washington School of Dentistry AGD student chapter, University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, Seattle King County Dental Society, Comet USA, Patterson Dental, and the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. Um, today's webinar is co-sponsored and actually put on by the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry. We'd like to thank Dr. Kenton Ross for putting this together. Uh, appreciate it. I'd like to introduce you to some of our panelists today. We have Dr. Gary Hayamoto with us from the WAGD, uh, Dr. Herb Edwards uh, from the CE Committee from the WAGD. Uh, Valerie Bartoli is our Executive Director and has been uh, the big cog in this machine. Thank you, Valerie. And uh, my name is Dr. Tim Hess. I'm also with the WAGD on the CE Committee. Uh, we've had probably 22,000 dentists uh, attend our webinars, and we appreciate everybody that has done so. Uh, these flyers that are going by for upcoming webinars, use the QR code to get registered. We've got lots of good offerings yet this week. And again, we will be adding more uh, webinars uh, here in the next couple of days. Those will appear on our website at washingtonagd.org. For those of you that are not familiar with Zoom, 
uh, just navigate around the, the application here. You'll see that there's different ways to uh, ask questions. That's a Q&A function. If you put questions in there and not the chat function, that would help us out. Uh, don't bother using the hands up uh, function. We're not going to use that today uh, unless uh, Dr. Robley uh, has a specific question that he wants people to put their hands up for. Um, in our Q&A section, if you see a question there that you like, use the thumbs up and that'll move that to the top. We're going to wait to the end of the presentation today uh, to hit Dr. Robley with any Q&A. So uh, don't expect your questions to be answered mid-stride. We just uh, don't really have the ability to do that cleanly. So um, Washington Academy of General Dentistry, the Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. No honorariums are being paid to any of our speakers. All uh, these are donated uh, webinars, and so we appreciate everybody that has supported us. It's been terrific. Remember, you do not need to be an AGD member to receive CE credit. You just need an active email address. So obviously, if you registered using that email address, look for an email in the next two or three days coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE department. Uh, I noticed in my inbox today, I had some CE credits from last Thursday. So it looks like they're catching up. And uh, so expect to see those in the next two or three days for today's webinar. Um, reminder, Terry Harris is tomorrow. If you have any questions, uh, you can uh, submit those at agd-covid at harrisbiomedical.net. But to be honest with you, uh, uh, Terry has had hundreds and hundreds of emails already. So your question is probably being asked to Terry. Uh, so don't feel bad if you missed that uh, email address. It'll be coming around again here. Uh, but don't forget, if you want to see Terry Harris, um, uh, we have a limit on the number of participants that can be on these uh, Zoom webinars. That's 3,000. But if you miss uh, any of our webinars because you can't get on because of the numbers there, you can simply go to YouTube after the fact. The only downside to that is we cannot offer CE credit for something you watch on YouTube. Live webinars, we're able to offer CE credit. Your CE credit will be based on uh, the amount of time you spend on the webinar. So, uh, if you're, it's a two-hour webinar and you spend an hour on there, you're going to get one hour of CE. And that CE will be coming from the University of Washington School of Dentistry, who's partnered with us on this Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series. Uh, just an absolute wonderful uh, uh, group of speakers yesterday from the International Academy of of Nathology. We thank Dr. Paul Hasegawa for putting that together for us. Uh, today, Dr. Kenton Ross has put together our speakers uh, that will be representing the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry. Uh, thanks to all our speakers from that area, including Dr. Peter Unger, who was one of our first speakers mm -hmm. uh, on this webinar series. Uh, quite the anthropologist and really, really important interesting information. I think that's the only uh, webinar that we've had so far advertised by the Smithsonian. So that was wow. pretty neat. Yeah. Uh, so we're getting close to start time. We've got about two minutes and we've got about half of our registered participants on. So we'll just drag our feet a little bit here and uh, just let everybody uh, uh, get familiar with the Zoom interface. Um, these webinars, we've had, as I said, 22,000 dentists, um, and that's uh, different dentists, uh, or in hygienists, et cetera, on these webinars. So that's been fantastic. We've had over 1,500 from Canada. So pretty neat to be able to share with everybody these webinars. Um, Fantastic. Look forward to having some of these speakers come out to Seattle to our WAGD Education Center. We've got a great facility that's got uh, five dental chairs in it. We can seat 140 for 
uh, uh, lectures, we have breakout rooms, we've got the ability to have hands-on courses. And you'll see uh, one of the flyers is our Master Track program. That Master Track program consists of four seminars, uh, or four sessions, pardon me, and each session has up to 28 hours of CE credit. So for those of you that are interested in becoming masters in the Academy of General Dentistry and um, are looking for hands-on courses, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry has that. And you'll see that flyer going by. If you don't have a chance to click the QR code there, you can just go to washingtonagd.org uh, and the course uh, offerings are listed there. You'll see um, all kinds of great speakers that we've already featured in our webinars. And we appreciate our uh, uh, speakers from the master track doing these webinars for us. Well, it looks like it's 930 now. And so we've got, uh, yeah, we're just about to our, our numbers that were registered. I just want to take the, this time to say again, thank you to all our sponsors. This is the Washington Academy of General Dentistry Stay Home, Stay Healthy CEE Series. Uh, it's co-sponsored by the University of Washington School of Dentistry CE, Patterson Dental, Comet USA, Seattle King County Dental Society, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and broadcasting to the Great White North via the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prostodontics. Today's speakers are hosted by the Arkansas Academy of General Dentistry. And with that, I'm going to just stop sharing my screen and introduce you to Dr. Kenton Ross. Dr. Ross, welcome, hey, sir. Hey, Dr. S. How are you this morning? I'm doing excellent. Thank you very much for reaching out to these guys that uh, I already know, but it's nice yeah. that you could twist their arms and Indeed. help yeah. us out. It takes, it takes an army, doesn't it? It's, uh, it's a pleasure to work with you. Uh, the Arkansas Academy of Dental Dentistry is just so thankful for the webinar series that has come together through this, uh, this crisis, this event. And uh, we're, we're just happy to play a small role in it today with three amazing speakers. So um, if we're ready to rock and roll, I'm going to give uh, Dr. Robley a little introduction here. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to introduce my mentor, Dr. Rick Robley, who I have um, had the pleasure of working with for almost 25 years now. Dr. Robley practiced general dentistry in Dallas, Texas, before going back to study graduate orthodontics at Baylor College of Dentistry. He's recognized uh, worldwide for his work in aesthetic dentistry, orthodontic techniques, and interdisciplinary therapy. He's given over, over 500 professional presentations in the United States, Canada, Europe, Australia, and Japan. Dr. Robley is a diplomat of the American Board of Orthodontics. He is the author of numerous publications and videos, including a textbook entitled Interdisciplinary Dental Facial Therapy, A Comprehensive Approach to Optimal Patient Care, published, uh, Quintessence Publishing. He is an associate clinical professor at Baylor College of Dentistry and in both the restorative and the orthodontic departments, and is an active member in numerous prestigious dental organizations, including the American Academy of Fixed Prosthodontics, the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry, and the American Academy of Aesthetic Dentistry, of which Dr. Robey is a past president. And he's also uh, been a mentor to our local study club for the 25 years I've been in practice with him. His background in restorative as well as orthodontic, orthodontics is, uh, is invaluable. We uh, he can approach it from so many different angles and know what we're thinking before we get in there. So Dr. Robey, without further ado, take it away. Well, thank you very much, Kenton. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to thank my good friend Kenton for such a kind introduction. Uh, he's also my key restorative interdisciplinary team member, so um, I lean on him heavily. You'll see a lot of his work today. I also want to thank um, the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, and especially um, Dr. Timmy Hess. What an awesome thing you, you guys are doing here. Um, just phenomenal in, this, in these trying times. Hopefully everybody is using this time well. Certainly we all have had opportunities to rejuvenate, refresh, and get started again and try to turn this lemon into lemonade. So um, anyway, hopefully we're all doing our part on that. 
my part today and something I'm, I'm really excited about, I'm going to share with you. It's really my lifelong work and Kent has touched on it briefly, but I'm from Arkansas and um, I was, went to high school and college here. I uh, went to Dallas where I did my um, DDS practice and taught and then did my graduate orthodontics before moving back and raising my family. And if you haven't been to Arkansas or you hadn't been lately or you haven't been to the Northwest corner, I highly recommend you do. It's, it's truly a wonderful place. Um, I'm so proud to be from here. And th what we're looking at now is the fall, the campus um, of the University of Arkansas. And if you look closely, you can see the SEC, SEC uh, sports facilities in the background, but in the foreground, is Ole Main, and that's certainly one of the largest landmarks and well-known landmarks in Arkansas. It was built in 1873 and is recently re uh, renovated, still used. It's used, actually used by the anthropology department, which we have close ties to. But if you notice that the tower on the right, which is the North Tower, is taller. Um, and, if, and it's curious why. I'll give you one specific hint. Um, the Civil War ended in 1865 in the North One. So the North Tower is just a little bit taller than the South Tower. But with that being said, if you ever come to Fayetteville, please let me know. I'd love to show you around. We're in the foothills, the Ozark Mountains, and um, one of the highest places between the Rockies and the Appalachians. So welcome. Let's go ahead and, and kick it off here. And, you know, this is, I'm going to fly through a bunch of information, trying to paint a picture with a very broad brush, but it's exciting times where we are today. Um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I've never, never been so excited to go into the office and help patients because today we're changing not only the quality of their lives, but we're also changing the quantity of their lives. And, and if you're not doing this yet, I highly encourage it. The title of my presentation is The Next Generation of Interdisciplinary Dental Facial Therapy, or IDT. And I feel it's going to be digitally empowered with an airway focus. And let's just kick right in and talk about some of the things that we're going to talk about. First of all, when it comes to patients like this, <clears throat> I want you to just ask yourself, how do you start addressing the issues? This patient wants to look better. She's been coming in for over 15 years trying to get a, a better appearance. Um, you know, when, what we need to understand is what we're going to call today the fundamental components of dental facial problems. So when you see issues, the interdisciplinary team needs to go right to the core of the problem and not just say deficiencies or class one or whatever. We need to know where and what structures are involved so we can ideally treat these. Because when we have structures that are, that are off, it can premature age people. For instance, this person, I feel, looks much older than she is. And she's 44. As I said, she's been coming in for 15 years and has not liked the treatment options. And we can see she's had significant treatment before. She's got a lot of um, thin tissues, thin phenotype, extreme overjet instability. And she wants something done, but doesn't want to do any tremendously big surgeries and, and, and costs. So how do you treat these type patients? How do you get into it? And how do you look at their overall health? Also, young patients, how do we treat those people? And we're going to treat these patients later on in, the, um, in this morning. But we look at this beautiful young lady, um, world-class ballerina. She's just gotten through with orthodontic treatment. And they came to me for a 13th opinion. And you can see her smile um, really doesn't match the beauty of her face. It's a little um, insufficient incisor exposure, which makes a much more senile look to her smile. But when we look at her radiographs, this is what she has. And so big problems. And this is where we need to be careful. We need to know what we are doing and not just start moving teeth or doing whatever. We have to, if we're doing anything, we need to be experts. This was actually an orthodontist thought they had magic brackets that could grow bone. And the reality is, is that's not true. 
we need to address the uh, fundamental components. And this is all part of an interdisciplinary approach um, that we've been working on in, in been gathering information from hundreds of different interdisciplinary teams to come up with the protocols and philosophies that we have today. So we'll treat that case later on today. And what about Suzanne here? She too, she comes in because she doesn't like the way her face is aging. And she's had orthodontic treatment twice. She's got incredible oral um, health. She takes great care of herself. She's got chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia. And she doesn't like the way her face is sunk in. And so we started looking at it and started picking up some overall medical issues that have not been addressed before. And when we look at her intraorally, we can see that, yes, she's got you know, good teeth and pretty good bite, but we'll see there's some significant traumatic relationships and airway issues. And we sent her for an airway evaluation and sure enough, she had moderate um, sleep apnea. And this hopefully is a part of everybody's treatment because we in dentistry need to have the ultimate interdisciplinary team that includes our counterparts in medicine. And so we'll talk a lot about that today and how we apply digital technology to make this happen. And when we function from an airway approach, an ethological approach, we're also going to get the most incredible aesthetic results that are possible. So let's kick off and let's start treating some teams and I mean, get our team together and start treating some cases. This is Lisa. She came in, um, has not had any significant treatment before. You can see one restoration. She desires a more beautiful smile. She's a executive in a corporate, uh, a five, uh, top 500 corporation and wants to a better looking smile. And we start talking to her again, gathering information. And she has chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, waking up five plus times a night, um, silent GERD, all these type things that we should know and understand. And when we talk airway, please don't misunderstand me. We're not always talking about sleep apnea. apnea. Sleep apnea is at the total end of the spectrum when it comes to airway issues. We wanna address issues as soon as they start with not only growth and development, but throughout mid the middle age, uh, especially females with upper airway resistance, which is what we feel she has. And so she wants her teeth straighter, but do we just ignore the medical, um, the, the medical symptoms that she's having? And I say, we don't. We need to get in the middle and help at least educate them so they can make an educated decision as to if they want to do something about it or not, and not just ignore them. Well, she wants a more beautiful smile. She's been told a lot of different things. She told that um, she needs um, her teeth taken out or severely um, reshaped to fit them all in. She's been told she needs, because she has increased lower face height, she needs to impact her maxilla and auto-rotate her mandible. She doesn't want anything to do with it. And these type cases, especially when we have medical symptoms involved, can get really complicated. And this is where a lot of us spend a lot of time in our practice and in, in trying to make decisions on what to do. She's been told she could have orthodontics with, well, you know, like I said, extractions or, or IPR. People have told her that she could have veneers and make her smile much more beautiful. Um, she's also been told, as I said, that she needs orthodontic surgery. And what about perio? How does that fit in? And this is in between all these is the interdisciplinary approach. And this is what we call the gray zone. And this is a key area that can make or break your practice and the decisions you make. And this is where we need to rely on our counterparts and not only the different disciplines in dentistry, but also medicine. And this is also critically important where evidence-based dentistry is. And it's important that we go by scientific evidence and that we can substantiate what we're doing from evidence. And if we don't have the evidence, we need to participate and help get the evidence. And I don't want to underestimate or under talk about the importance of clinical experience to apply scientific evidence. 
And I'm not talking about clinical experience being doing the same thing wrong over and over with ever increasing confidence like we frequently see in our profession, I hate to say. We're not talking about that. Instead, we're talking about the fact that we do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. Very, very important. And that's where differences are made in our profession. And so I highly encourage you to not only have the scientific evidence, but learn from what you're doing in applying it by scientifically reflecting on that experience. Very, very important. And then one of the most important things and critical to your success in your practice and satisfaction is to also satisfy the patient's needs and preferences. And so that's a very complicated issue that we will be talking about a lot because we need to satisfy their needs and preferences, but also fulfill our role as healthcare professionals. And so back to Lisa, let's talk about how we look at the interdisciplinary diagnosis and treatment planning. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna show a case and then we're gonna go back in history. And we're gonna look at 30 years of evolution, 35 years of evolution of the, of the interdisciplinary process. And when we, um, as Kenton has said, our team, we always come up with three different treatment plans. First of all, we always start with ideal. If we don't start with ideal, we'll never get there. And so we, we always force ourselves not to cut corners with our initial treatment plan. Then we always come up with a secondary treatment plan that we call interdisciplinary alternatives when for some reason interdisciplinary ideal is not an option um, for a particular reason or not or the patient just doesn't want to do it. And this is where we can go for about it from different disciplines coming up with a very creative treatment plan with an excellent result and an excellent long-term prognosis, which is also critically uh, important for the success of the team. And if options one or two aren't available, we don't jump in and just start doing compromise care. Instead, we do something called interdisciplinary treatment phasing, where we start treat pathology, we may treat airway, TMD, we may do restorations, but maybe not long-term definitive restorations unless they fit into options one or two. And so we don't shut the door. We try to always lead, um, try to leave the door open for optimal care. And we even also, the team needs to understand what makes a treatment option desirable or undesirable, which is a very important part to the team and to the patient. And certainly a lot of times as we'll talk about today, ideal treatment options just don't exist. Think of days before, times before implants or composite resin bonding. Um, and like I and several other people probably that are on you know, can attest to. And so this is where we need to, again, use our clinical experience and knowledge and scientific evidence to be creating more. But usually it's also due to an unacceptable cost to benefit ratio. It could be money, um, as we know. Um, it could be today, it's different, it could be the time, it could be inconvenience, the patient doesn't want, the, you know, they want to maintain aesthetics during treatment today, which in the past, you know, 20, 30 years ago, that wasn't as big a deal. Obviously, they want to have, not have discomfort, you know, excellence in the final result, you know, the morbidity of treatment, the predictability, and certainly we want stability and longevity. And today, we also want something that is certainly not going to compromise air, airway and ideally improve airway. And the dilemmas we all have is that um, the patient wants something cheap, fast, without any inconvenience. She wants to look great every day of treatment. She doesn't want any discomfort and she wants an excellent result, obviously. The doctor, on the other hand, certainly wants an excellent result, but he doesn't or she doesn't want to be talked into something that has a high morbidity or is very unpredictable. We don't want to have to hit a grand slam every time. And we also want to do something that's not a quick makeover, but something that's going to last and be stable. And we want something that's going to improve the airway, if at all possible. So we're going to look at interdisciplinary ideal for her. And when we look at her case overall, um, as we said, that she has fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, her, she's waking up um, five plus times, she goes to the bathroom a couple times, 
And so we're going to do some initial testing. And we use a high-res pulse oximetry, which is very, very important to the process. It looks at something significantly different than um, a normal sleep study. Because I don't think she has sleep apnea. I think she has upper airway resistance problems, which we know the evidence is out there is every bit as problematic and maybe even more problematic symptom-wise than mild to moderate sleep apnea. And what's going on is the patient is struggling to get the proper amount of oxygen at night. They get it, but it's at the expense of their sleep because when the blood oxygen drops a little bit, they're healthy, so they get a shot of adrenaline and all night long, they're in flight or fight, as you can see from these spikes and not getting that deep restorative sleep. And so this is where we can make a huge difference. <clears throat> but how do we do that? Um, we look at her um, and we can see that she's, her chief concern is she wants a prettier smile. And so this is where we can jump in, use that to our advantage and motivate her for aesthetics, but also um, help her um, with her overall health issues. And when I look at her, you know, I see a very constricted upper arch. Um, she has a long lower face. And in reality, the only thing, the only two things in the right place in her smile is her two central incisors. And you can see she's posterior VME where all the upper posterior teeth have, have grown down and her mandible is auto-rotated open. And so this is a much trickier case than it looks because you could actually put her in braces or aligners and here she is, you can see the posterior VME, teeth are in the right spot. And what we want to do is this, intrude all the upper posterior teeth, rotate the mandible closed. But if we're not careful, it's easier to extrude the front teeth and turn a posterior VME into a full VME. And so this is where the team has to understand the nuances of these problems and diagnosis and treatment planning and understand and be able to control all the fundamental components. And so what we're going to do for her is that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna leave her teeth in the front, in the right place. We're gonna overexpand her upper jaw. We're gonna intrude all of her posterior teeth and we're gonna auto rotate the mandible because we know she has, if we look at the rule of thirds, an increased lower face height significantly. And you can see how our mandible is rotated back and deficient with mild lip incompetency. And to do this, and we're gonna be talking a lot about this today, we use something called surgically facilitated orthodontic therapy or SFOT for short. And this is something the entire team needs to be involved with. The, by definition, um, it's any surgical procedure that directly or indirectly facilitates traditional orthodontic therapy or its long-term results. And, the, you know, it's known that by Wickeldonics, PAOO, and numerous other things, um, but it's known for its speed. And speed is not what I use it for. To me, speed is like aesthetics in that we can use it to motivate the patients to do the things that we need to do as healthcare professionals. And the benefits I'm after is significantly less root resorption, better in phenotype uh, modification and improvement. It expands the orthodontic um, limits and its positive effects on the airway. And we'll go into detail on that. It also, since it rejuvenates the entire infrastructure with something called regional accelerator phenomenon, we actually rebuild the infrastructure. And so it enhanced, enhances the stability of the result over traditional orthodontic tooth movement, especially when we address the function and habits that probably led to the malocclusion and discrepancies in the first place. And it's invaluable, as you will see, to the interdisciplinary therapy. And certainly, I know Kenton can attest to that. What are the, some of the procedures? Certainly, um, it all starts with hard and soft tissue grafting and selective corticotomies, which are just cuts through the cortical plate into the uh, medullary bone. We can also do single or multiple tooth osteotomies, which are 
actual through and through cuts and we get individual dental osseous segments or implant osseous segments. We also are doing a lot of bone borne expansion now and, and we won't have too much time to touch on that, but that's a whole new realm of SFOT that we're really um, excited about and using a lot. And some of the new surgical strategy over the last 30 years, especially since um, I wrote my textbook um, almost 30 years ago, where we used to do everything before for the infrastructure for perio and everything else. Today, we minimize surgeries while maximizing minimally invasive surgical outcomes. Um, and what I mean by that, we don't do prophylactic grafting or crown lengthening um, unless there is some type of inflammatory pathology going on in the periodontium. Instead, we wait till during orthodontics to see what we can do to utilize that to improve the orthodontic tooth movement. All right, so here we go. Here's the deep corticotomies. You can see the, the osseous grafting. Uh, we set up a wrap effect, and so it's, it makes the bone feel it's been injured. He mineralizes by over 50%. We get a four to five time bony turnover, a recruitment of cells, and we can just change the entire infrastructure. And we can do osseous grafting, soft tissue grafting all at the same time. The same is true on the lower. We just, since we're going facially and intruding, all we have to do is um, the facial. We don't have to do palatal. And we do all this with Invisalign. The patient refuses to have braces, which is fine. My treatment of choice is clear aligners now. We're using Anchorage to help us intrude the posterior teeth. And of course, all the literature is there. And we go from there to there, okay, in one round um, of therapy. And look at exactly what we talked about. Remember we said the front, the two centrals were in the right place and the posteriors were all in the wrong place. Well, look at, we absolutely control that. Look how much volume we've changed. More volume for the tongue helped get the airway opened up. Um, and again, all these things are not only critically important, they're also much more beautiful because it fits our ideal norms. That's, this is the way things were meant to be. And the beautiful part about this is how long do you think this took? One round of aligners. We were, this is four months worth of treatment and look at the difference. We're not done yet. I still need to fine tune and tweak, but she is not only um, thrilled with the results so far, she's reporting that she's sleeping through the night. She's getting off her meds. She has more energy. She's exercising again. And even though a 2D, a 3D SEPs, we, you know, it's not, you know, totally accurate. It is a good litmus test. We can see we open the airway by about 50%. But this is where the, the, the tire hits the road, the rubber hits the road right here. We reduced her symptoms um, of airway and upper airway resistance by over 75%. And this is just by creating more volume working with the normal function. And here she is. 48 months after completion. Look how beautiful the periodontium is. Look at that beautiful full smile. Um, and you can see how much uh, more oral volume she has. And look at her face. And you can see how we decreased her lower face height. We intruded the posterior, gave her that full. And she is a huge, huge fan of what we were um, to do to help her. So this is what we're going to be talking about for the next hour or so is this type of treatment and how we've gotten to this level. And there are lots of different things. I'm an orthodontist. So, you know, I'm going to be talking some about from that orthodontic standpoint. Also, um, everything I do is restorative driven. So we'll be talking about that. But what do we have to help us now? We're going to talk about the maturation of the interdisciplinary team, which is and understand that, which is critically important. We're also going to spend time on the fundamental components of dental facial problem, which I think is critically important for the team to really understand what we can do to help each other help the patients. And then a better understanding of the importance of the airway and dentistry's role in developing it and maintaining it. 
and understanding all the different dimensions of all the different structures and, and transverse AP and vertical and how we can control and modify those. We're also gonna look at a little bit of anthro anthropo anthropologically driven structure, function, and behavior, which is exciting and fun and eye-opening. And we also need to address mild functional therapy. And, and for years, we thought we can just change the structure and everything will take care of itself. My philosophy as a trained pathologist has changed radically. And what I understand now is the lower face has a genetic potential, but that's not what dictates the final structure. What dictates the final structure is soft tissue function or dysfunction. Just like the cranium, it doesn't grow and the brain fills it. The cranium grows, I mean, the brain grows and the cranium fit, um, is built to protect it. The orbits of the eyes don't grow and the eyes fill them. The eyes develop and their function develops and the orbits function or you know, develop around it. But so does the lower face. And so the modern man malocclusions are typically from soft tissue function or dysfunction. And we can't just go and treat the structure without readdressing the soft tissue um, function and habits, or we're just going to have relapse in the long term. <clears throat> also, interdisciplinary communication with intermediate restorations, relying on our restorative counterparts, patient centric, cloud based collaborative health records, sophisticated orthodontic brackets, and precision indirect bonding high-tech aligner therapy, which you just showed, you know, high-frequency vibration, light, light, and other acceleration techniques, which is still a little bit up in the air in, in orthodontic world. And what would we do without CBCT technology? Um, I can't even imagine not having that information. And then we can also talk about digital smile design, you know, with Christian Coachman and others are, have, have, you know, really put together and are, are promoting, it's really changed my practice as well as a digital workflow. We're even using artificial intelligence now to monitor some of these remote um, cases. And also we're using it today with the, with the COVID um, quarantines to monitor our patients remotely. It's just as good as if they were right um, in the office with us. We use absolute anchorage with plates, implants, and screws. And then, you know, sophisticated um, surgically facilitated orthodontic therapy, as we talked about earlier, okay? And orthodontic surgery, looking at the picture with orthodontic surgical improvement, um, surgical techniques, and the digital planning, and pre and post orthodontics utilizing clear aligners, um, you know, for the orthodontic surgery. So, you know, in my opinion, and I have no relationship with any clear aligner, um, um, company, but I do see that as undoubtedly the interdisciplinary tool in orthodontics of the future, and really today, and being part of the team for so many different reasons that we'll, we'll touch on today. So let's talk about the interdisciplinary process and where we've come over the last 35 years. And I'm going to go through this really quick, but I think we can't talk about where we're going unless we talk about where we've been. And especially since we're going to be talking a lot about digital technology and what it's doing for us. Because digital technology is awesome. It can do phenomenal things in the diagnosis and treatment planning, idealizing the flow of treatment. But we have to be careful because it can significantly give false confidence to people that they can do things that they're not qualified to do. And I'll, I'll, stress, the, I'll stress that more and more. Nothing um, takes the place of scientific knowledge and experience when you're doing these things. And to think that you can do the same thing of somebody who's been successfully doing it for years and years with the right study is not what we're talking about, okay? Um, but the interdisciplinary process, let's talk, let's go back all the way to the beginning when, you know, orthodontics was the first specialty in the U.S. And, you know, when we first started 110 plus years ago, you know, it was more disciplinary where 
you know, each discipline was a separate entity, you know, in their own separate world. Um, and then, you know, over the years, certain things happened. Um, you know, we, we had non-integrated diagnosis and treatment planning, you know, ignorance really of the other disciplines. They were just kind of out there, you know, minimal collaboration and certainly minimal getting together and having teamwork. And then over the years, you know, our sphere of knowledge in each discipline expands and starts overlapping a little bit more and more, and that gets things a little bit more complicated. Um, but we start becoming aware of the benefits of the other disciplines. And the problems are, though, is that we still had separate goals. I mean, think about it. In the past, the surgeon um, would have one philosophy for aesthetics and, say, occlusion periodontist would have another, orthodontist another, and certainly the restorative dentist having another. How can you treat as a team if you have separate goals? And that's where we used to bump heads a lot. And then unstructured collaboration, where you were not really communicating. We need real-time collaboration and, and, and structure. And we'll talk about that's part of the next generation we'll be stressing so much. And then about the mid 1980s, we started talking about interdisciplinary, early interdisciplinary, where there, all of our knowledge and it started expanding and, and we started overlapping more and more. And this is where we want to be practicing in as a team. And there's lots of information out there. And this is when I wrote my first textbook. Um, and I actually differentiated in that the difference between inter and multi. Multi means working with different disciplines, and it's certainly uh, a step in the right direction. But inter signifies working between the different disciplines as one entity, and really an important differentiation. And what we find when we do that is that Um, it, it, we have cases like this, and um, let's go back in the past now and look at the early interdisciplinary cases. Here's Hannah, age 15, and this is actually a, a case I did over 30 years ago. And, um, you know, looking at her beautiful face, but when she smiles, her chief concern is she doesn't like her small teeth and gummy smile. You can see why, but she's got beautiful features. But how do we treat that? And again, go back in time. And this is circa 1987. And, you know, we can look at it today and think about all the things that we want to do. And we can look at, you know, all these advancements that we have that we, that we spent a few minutes talking about and we'll spend more time talking about. Literally, none of those existed. And so what I'm saying is that we really need to try to understand the basics, the foundation of how to treat these problems, even if we don't have all the sophisticated advancements that we have today. And so back then, we didn't have even implants um, necessarily that we were working with. We certainly didn't have SFOT. We had, you know, very rudimentary um, brackets and orthodontics. We didn't have the tremendous periodontal things we do, we're just then starting um, bonded porcelain restorations. And, and we didn't even have light cured composite resin, believe it or not. You can see the traumatic occlusion, she's got impacted teeth. So how do we address these issues? Uh, do we, you know, this is where if you don't have a team approach and look at the fundamental problems, you can just start treating and get yourself into trouble. We also have impacted teeth. And this is where when you have a game plan and break things down, you can turn problems into advantages. We're gonna use these impacted canines as anchorage to help intrude the teeth because we didn't have absolute anchorage then. We're gonna use intrusion mechanics and that really understand control of the teeth. And we're gonna intrude those teeth and then we're gonna do aesthetic crown lengthening with Pat Allen to expose because we know that we want to treat to the CEJ. And so exposing that full tooth structure. And then what we did is we went back to our prosthetics and we picked ideal shaped and size um, teeth and we showed them to the patient. Now, now we had a virtual, a visual, I'm sorry, a roadmap of what we wanted to do. 
and so then we mounted and you know took models and did wax ups and kept moving and you know open call springs and it's not only spacing it's intruding the teeth so this is very very um, complex work and you can see that after Pat's done his second aesthetic recontouring now we have the full um, dental structures exposed and yes she has microdontia and so again um, now we're going to do uh, go from there to here big difference and now we're going to do an indirect remember no light cured bonding but we're still using indirect techniques to hold these teeth in the right position so that we can go in and minimally um, prepare the teeth, put in some nice provisional restorations and work out function, cross mount, do some bonded porcelain restorations and you can see the beautiful result at that particular time. I look at it today and I would do things radically different. But look at the nice inner incisal relationship um, that we're doing now. And you can see, um, filling out our lip support a little bit. But look at the progression of care, all this without all the modern things. So we can do amazing things uh, without technology and advances, but we can even do it much more predictably and more easy. And this is where I started really uh, valuing the patient's appreciation for what we were doing to help them. It just blew my mind. I felt so blessed to have the opportunity to do this. And, and feel their appreciation. And so this early interdisciplinary, let's talk about that. What did that all entail, like we just showed? First of all, what we call an early common knowledge. That's knowledge that cuts across all disciplines, things that we should know about each other's treatment to help each other help the patients. And when we do that, we start appreciating what we can do to help each other in the different disciplines, help the patient, instead of un- um, knowingly criticizing each other for unrealistic expectations and really lack of knowledge about the limitations. We also started having common goals in inclusion and aesthetics. We started having structured collaboration with common records. We'd actually do a chart in a binder and put all the records in there and that would go with the patient rather than everybody starting over. And it's amazing today how many people still do it the old way, the multidisciplinary way where they start over um, evaluating the patient, even though they've gone through a couple different evaluations already. So total waste of time. And this is where we developed all kinds of structures and all these things to, to really do the information. I'm not, I'm not stressing this. We've come way past this. This is um, before even Al Gore invented the internet. And so, um, you know, we, we had to use couriers and other things. But then Debbie comes along. This is 1989. And we look at her. She has a significant overbite. Um, she doesn't like her smile. She has worn incisors um, and asymmetries. Look at how far her midline's off and lack of volume. And so I'm not saying that this is ideal treatment by today's standard. But by then, it was really significant because the interdisciplinary approach was still in its infancy. And so we're gonna break things down and we're gonna look at the different structures, but here's her interdisciplinary book and her treatment plan that the team leader puts together, all the slides and radiographs are in there. And then this goes to each provider who reviews their medical and dental history and adds to it and modifies it as needed and doesn't start over, okay? And the way we're going to treat her is we're going to do orthodontics to intrude uh, again her teeth. Um, we're going to so we can get more incisor exposure um, in the end by lengthening the teeth with less gingival display. And we're going to add intermediate restorations. We only have too much time to talk about those today, but that's a critically important part of what we do. And so Another teammate of mine, Bob Tennant, added incisal edges um, to replace the wear. And what I'm going to tell you is that we're doing things absolutely, totally out of order. Okay, today we're much more sophisticated. And the reason why we should have waited is because we treat to the CEJ. 
And here's Pat Allen's beautiful work. It's set a crown lengthening, creating an ideal architecture, exposing the CEJ. But look at the difference. Even though I sounded the bone, look how far off I was um, on intruding the teeth for Bob. Today, we would do the set of crown lengthening first, then add the ideal incisal edges to restore the dental component. And so here's her smile. This is after dental alveolar therapy or orthodontics to intrude. You can see how we're changing the incisal edge position. Now we add the incisal edges back. And then we also go ahead and do the aesthetic crown lengthening. And today, uh, again, we would do things significantly different, but yet you can see um, the nice change in the result. The more beautiful smile from the buccal corridors. And look at the difference in her smile. And she's absolutely ecstatic in the results. But this is also what we call interdisciplinary phasing because she can't afford or doesn't want to have the veneers done now. And so these intermediate restorations can last a long time. And it was 17 years later that she ended up having ideal veneers with minimal reduction because we set everything in place and we did interdisciplinary phasing. And that's, again, the ultimate lifelong interdisciplinary team approach. So you can see the progression of treatment. And then Char comes in. And Char, you know, here's now 2005. We're rapidly um, progressing forward. Her chief concern is that she doesn't like her short teeth and gummy smile. And so what I have to ask you is, what does that mean? What does it mean that, that, that tells us nothing from an interdisciplinary team perspective of what we need to treat? Both short teeth and gummy smile are kind of categorizations of the interactions of different fundamental components. We need to be the astute diagnosticians to break these down. And so this is where we start growing more as an interdisciplinary team into more what I call mature interdisciplinary. In mature interdisciplinary, we actually start using evidence-based common knowledge. And the different team members think alike. And that's scary when a restorative dentist, an orthodontist, and a periodontist, and a surgeon all think alike. But that's where we get when we have a common base. And in fact, this makes the efficiency of the interdisciplinary process radically better. We also have common values and goals, not only for each treatment, but for treatment overall. And we have seamless collaboration with common cloud-based patient records. Again, very, very important. Um, everything's on the web, accessible by anybody, HIPAA compliant. And I can't tell you what this has done to change everything that we do. So we can be focusing in this areas of overlap as much as patient as possible. And we start considering airway, and I think this is critically important, and we welcome digital technology to help us whenever possible. And so again, look at the couriers. Again, you know, we, uh, we had telecommunications, but not the internet. Look at this cell phone. Uh, so this is where our technology has come radically. These are actually di uh, diagrams from my, from my textbook back in the early 90s. But we came out with something, you know, again, everything's built, I'll be honest with you, for our team in Fayetteville and in Northwest Arkansas to develop our team and get it better. We've had so much information from so many different giants around the world um, in, in dentistry. So we certainly don't take credit for all of it. But one of the things we did is we break things down to the point of being ridiculous for an interdisciplinary perspective. We call that the fundamental components of interdisciplinary problems. And this is important because we wanna break it down to the point of being ridiculous. And so when you hear this, you might think, well, you know, I know that, that's no big deal. But when you use it as a team and start diagnosing what problems are actually involved, you start treatment planning at the same time. And these fundamental components are critical for you educating the rest of your team. I can't stress that enough. The first one 
is dental. And dental is pretty straightforward. It's, you know, the shape and integrity and health of the teeth. And when you have issues with that, what do you do? It's restorative dentistry. So if it's a dental problem, we do restorative dentistry. Also, if it's pulpal pathology, um, we consider that a dental problem also that requires endodontic therapy. The next one is periodontal. Periodontal has to do with the health and stability and integrity of the periodontal structures. And importantly, the relationship of the periodontal structures in relationship to the teeth. And there's so many different areas that, that you know, this involves with recession and, and um, periodontal um, periodontitis and, and a whole host of other things. And this is where we're so fortunate. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate our counterparts in, you know, with Imperio in the periodontal plastic surgery um, realm. And so that's a critical part of our interdisciplinary process. But then we start getting out further. We start getting into the bony structures. And this is where my area of, of treatment now is, is primarily focused. And alveolar is so important, we actually broke it down into two different categories. And we actually coined um, the term in 2009. Um, in an article we did in the compendium, we actually coined um, SFOT. And we also coined the term, um, you know, not dental alveolar, but the term alveoloskeletal, which we'll talk about in a minute. Dental alveolar has to deal with the dental alveolar structures, their integrity, their relationships, and importantly, the relationship of the teeth in the alveolar complex. And so we start breaking that down. This is where a whole host of dental alveolar surgeries are involved. Also, this is where orthodontics is involved to treat dental positions problems in the alveolar bone, okay? And so if you have a tipped tooth, that's a dental alveolar problem that orthodontics should correct. And so if you have a missing first molar, the lower second molar tips in, and you try to, like I used to do back in my restorative days, do some kind of precision attachment to do a, a stress-breaking bridge there. We're not treating the real underlying problem. We're basically treating a, a dental alveolar problem restorative-wise. And so this is where uprighting the tooth and ideally doing it, uh, um, the bridge with, with, with um, restorative is not only ideal, it's so much simpler and less stressful and a greater long-term prognosis because we're treating the right problems. Also a missing tooth, what kind of problem is that? Well, I feel the big problem is you don't have the root in the alveolar bone. And so that's where implant dentistry is so important. Yes, we could do bridges, and, and bridges are really good treatment in a lot of cases, but we're still compromising the adjacent teeth that we're reducing. Ideally, it's a good alternative to put an implant in, replace the root, and then turn it into a restorative problem. The next area of alveolar that we talked about is alveoloskeletal. Alveoloskeletal, as I said, is a term we coined in 2009 because we figured out that there was a whole host of issues that we didn't really have a good treatment for. Alveoloskeletal deals with the relationship of the dental alveolar complex on the skeletal base. It's that yellow here. And you're gonna be amazed how many issues that you're gonna see related to that. Again, it's very, very important. And then with alveoloskeletal, um, that's where SFOT is unbelievably a, a powerful tool. Skeletal, the relationship of the skeletal components to one another and the discrepancies there, that's where orthodontic surgery and other procedures is critically important. Temporal mandibular, the health and integrity of the temporal mandibular complex and the masticatory muscles, where frequently we have to do conservative therapy and sometimes surgical therapy, but it's critical and important that we address that because that is one of the foundations long-term for stability in our results. Facial soft tissue, the dynamics, the lip length, the function, the aging process, all these things to understand how the soft tissue affects um, the hard tissue underneath and vice versa. And that's where we use plastic surgery and other things when needed 
um, sometimes it's just an important diagnostic principle to make sure we don't over treat the wrong fundamental component. And then we have a kind of a big basket we throw things called systemic. Systemic is actually um, things outside of our realm in, in dentistry that affect us, maybe something like diabetes or or well health issues, or maybe centrally driven bruxism or tongue thrust, things we have to get help from from outside. This is also an area that you know I think airway fits into. So it affects all of our treatment and we need to rely on other professionals to help us. And so these are the fundamental components and you look at it and it looks incredibly simple, but yet I promise you, when you treat to them, it's incredibly profound. But notice there might be a few missing. Um, you know, for instance, where is occlusion? Occlusion is not in there. Does that mean that I think occlusion is not important? No, I think it's absolutely critically important, but occlusion is not a fundamental component. Instead, it's a categorization of the interrelationship of different fundamental components. And so if you have a severe class two malocclusion, that tells me nothing about what I need to do to treat. I need to know, is it dental? Is it skeletal? Dental alveolar, alveoloskeletal. So I'm treating the right problems. And case in point, Quick case, this patient was referred to me by P.D. Miller, who saw her um, as a, as a um, uh, second opinion after she's had three periodontal surgeries, okay, to fill that um, black triangle. And, you know, P.D. Miller took one look at her and said, you know what, this isn't a periodontal problem, it's a different problem. And this is where we need to break things down somebody's already done three surgeries trying to put gum tissue where God never intended gum tissue to live. And so this is where we need to break things down into the fundamental components and problem list. And, you know, she has poor crown contours, number eight and nine. Those are dental problems and it's an iatrogenic dental problem. We all know what happened. The patient came in with a gap between her front teeth and somebody said, I can fix that and did crowns, okay, to fix it and only to make the problem different. Um, she's got, with those poor crown contours, she's got wide width length ratios, again, triangular shaped teeth, and incisely positioned contacts. And we know from the work, the beautiful work of Dennis Townell and others that, again, gum tissue's never meant to live there. And so every surgery they did, the back triangle got worse and the tissue that they added just migrated gingerly. And so we're going to um, look at the rest of the problems and the excess of the interdental space, which of course was the original problem that was mistreated. That's a dental alveolar problem. She has excessive anterior horizontal overlap. That's a dental alveolar problem. It's not really a problem, it's an advantage. We could easily use that to close that spaces if we were given the opportunity. And the treatment plan, Provisionally restore proper dental anatomy in emergence form three-dimensionally. And then do dental alveolar therapy with orthodontics to put the teeth in the right position and do final restorations. Note, perio isn't even in it. Um, so that's, that's not a periodontal problem. Take the restorations off. I put some you know, good provisionals on with proper form. And then we start moving the teeth where they should be, correcting the dental alveolar problems. And all of a sudden we look at the papillary tissues and now we have too much of a good thing. You can see all that extra tissue that was added. Now we have flat marginal contours. We're gonna send her to the periodontist. She refused to do aesthetic crown lengthening after having so many surgeries. So all they would let him do is do a little bit of enamel plasty here look at how nice everything is healing up and then we do some restorations here she, here she is and this is 18 years later when you treat the right problem it's incredibly predictable and it lasts the integrity is phenomenal and so let's go back with that and talk about char whose chief concern is she doesn't like her short teeth and gummy smile which tells us nothing about what problems we should treat as an interdisciplinary team. 
So let's kind of break them down. This is where we get into interdisciplinary collaboration and we have centric, um, patient-centric cloud-based EHRs now, where everything we do is in the cloud in a, in a um, common platform and here's actually what it looks like. Anybody can access it on any device, all her records, all her, our treatment notes, all our referrals, everything is in there. So the pay, we don't have to be communicating all the time and asking questions or and mailing or whatever. We're actually, everybody knows where it is and they can access it when they need to. And we need a patient-centric. What does patient-centric mean? It's that it's built to, for the patient to be optimally restored by their team, as opposed to doctor-centric, provider-centric is a healthcare system, health record system that is used to, for the provider to treat their patients. And so that is what just about everything else is. And why is our patient-centric health record so important? You know, the same reason why airline safety is so important um, and why it's so good, especially in the U.S. with the minimal fatalities concerning all the millions and millions of people traveling, it's because every screw that's ever turned on an airplane is logged in one log book. And when they have a problem, they go to that log book and figure it out and they fix it. And what I'm saying is, is why is our health so much different than that? And just think about most of us out here have 40, 50, 60 different health records scattered all over the place. No wonder it's confusion, confusing. And so um, we'll go through this quickly. The problem with an analog provider centric is that everybody collaborates as they feel like it. They may text, call, um, they might send a, a speed form, they might dictate a letter that nobody reads, or they might not do anything at all. It's totally one way communication. And this is where the World Wide Web, I thought, was gonna really help everything out. But the problem is, is now everybody's spending 10, 50, 100 thousands of dollars to digitally store their records and they're still doing the unidirectional um, non-uniform um, um, type collaboration, which is again, not efficient or effective. And so this is where, you know, you might say, I'm gonna start a team record where for this patient that the, you know, the oral surgeon does that the different providers can can access, that's not what we're talking about. Because what if the orthodontist says, okay, I've got the platform now, I can make mine, and everybody's trying to figure out where the patient records are. Instead, there needs to be one common one that everybody accesses. I think we're gonna see, we've certainly seen over the last 10 years the everybody trying to do this. We're still a long ways from it. The system we use is definitely that though. It's cloud-based and it's patient-centric. Um, health record, all right? And it's, we can all communicate and collaborate with everybody, but it's bi-directional, okay? And it, what it looks like is, you know, we had start a virtual chart and say, I'm provider A, I start it, I put all the information in there, and then I make a referral, say, to Kenton. And I can share only the information I want, and so I can have my own information, Kenton can have his, and this is what we we share with one another, and we can actually call, you know, Dr. Hess and get his expertise as a visiting doctor on the case, all HIPAA compliant, and it's all built around the patient, the most important team member, and them having access. Even our, our laboratory technicians are involved, okay? And so this has really radically helped us grow from the days of the common booklet, which was critically important, it's just that that analog format quickly um, overran us. So getting back to Char, um, you know, again, her chief concern is that she doesn't like her smile. And let's break it down into the, you know, the fundamental components because her chief concern, she has small teeth and a gummy smile. Why? And so let's go ahead and do a problem list with the fundamental components. First of all, she has excessive gingival display gummy smile, which can be periodontal, it could be a dental alveolar, it could be alveolar skeletal, it could be facial soft tissue with short lip or excessive translation, it could be skeletal. And more than likely, it's a combination of those. 
again, that's why it's important we all understand what we're doing and try to break it down and treat the right problems. She has short clinical crowns. That's going to be either a dental or a periodontal fundamental component. With, with extra tissues, the incisal wear, that one's simple. That's a dental problem. The question is how much incisal wear does she have and how much should we, do we need to restore? And so to figure out which fundamental components are involved with these categorizations, again, just like occlusion, these are categorizations of interrelationships of, of, of problems so we can communicate. And so we have to do a clinical evaluation and we start by determining facial form. And we look at her, and she's a beautiful um, young woman. And we feel that her facial proportions are within normal limits. And obviously, as an orthodontist, I'm going to back that up supplementarily. We look and evaluate lip length and function. OK, that's facial soft tissue. And sure enough, um, she, um, her lip length and her function are within normal limits. So it's not a facial soft tissue problem. So we start checking different fundamental components off. And then we look at the desired incisal position. Um, and we start out by looking at the lips in repose, the most important aesthetic evaluation. I think we look at, I call that the centric relation of aesthetic dentistry is incisal edge position at rest, because that's what people see her 95% um, of the time, okay? And so when we look at her and look at her smile line and her lips in repose, you know, um, young to middle-aged female, we want to show a little bit more tooth structure than normal. And I think her incisal edges are in a good position. And so I want to err a little bit on the side of excessive because that's more youthful. And so we want to end up with the incisal edges where they are now. So therein lies the problem. How are we going to give her the length and reduce the gingival display. And so we feel that her incisal edge is, is really where we need it to be in the end. And so looking a little bit closer, now we go, we, we treat to the CEJ, really important. We don't do the radical crown lengthening like we used to. Instead, we go ahead and we always treat, because I can move the two, we control all the fundamental components. So when we do sounding, we, there's actually um, the bone and is right down on the CEJ. And so that's leading to excessive tissue of about a millimeter and a half. That's part of the problem. You can call it altered passive eruption, whatever you want to call it. But to me, she's got an extra millimeter and a half of bone and soft tissue covering healthy tooth structure. So that's a millimeter and a half now we can add in length. And when we do that, she still has short squatty crowns and still has a, a gingival display. And so we go a step further, we have to evaluate in size of wear. How do we do that? Well, we don't know how much her teeth are wearing, but we have great clinical evidence, uh, scientific evidence about what the tooth form should be. And we don't have wear in approximately, and she's got normal sized teeth. So we can quickly evaluate the width and calculate how long those teeth should be. And from that, we feel that she, her front teeth need to be about a millimeter and a half longer than they have right now. So immediately we have three millimeters of length. And when we add those three millimeters of length, all of a sudden it gets into her lower lip. And now she's showing too much incisor exposure at rest. And she still has a gummy display. And so that's where we need to look at the other fundamental components to see how much dental alveolar extrusion she has. And what we feel is that all these teeth are down about a millimeter and a half more than they should be. And so to get at the right desired length, we've got to move all these teeth up about a millimeter and a half. So we move the teeth up a millimeter and a half with orthodontics aesthetic crown lengthening, and then restore optimal form. So we have our diagnosis and treatment plan, very straightforward. And that puts us, you know, exactly where we need to be. All right, the treatment plan, orthodontic, orthodontic, I mean, orthodontic alignment and intrusion, that's dental alveolar problem, aesthetic crown lengthening, periodontal problem, 
uh, rest restoration in sizal tooth form that's dental. And the sequencing is what's critical. And this is where our sequencing has changed and it's changed since then. And so we need to really think that through. What we did is we first did the level and aligning and intruded one and a half millimeters, okay? Then instead of adding the restorative, we wanted to find not guesstimate or bone sound. We wanted to figure out exactly where the osseous levels were. And so we're gonna do the aesthetic crown lengthening to ideally relate the tissues now. And this is where we have exact parameters that should be part of the common knowledge of what we're trying to restore. Because if we can restore these type of relationships, we can get optimal papillary fill 90 plus percent of the time. And this is our common knowledge, our common language. And this is, I don't send to our periodontist, my curry, I don't send him a, you know, crown length and this much or this much, he treats to the CEJ. And then if, if everything's off, I change it through alveoloskeletal or dental alveolar correction. And so we're gonna do aesthetic crown lengthening with Pat, Pat Allen, a good friend of mine. Um, you can see how much extra bone, you can't do this with the laser. You have to reshape and thin and festoon this bone. And this is a, actually a different patient. Um, but you can see how nicely it looks immediately after treatment. Here she is four weeks. So here she is immediately after therapy. Letting the tissue heal. And now we need to add tooth form back. And this is where we have the ratios that we can talk to. This is steroid study. And so what I did is I took impressions in the morning. She was actually an assistant of mine measured the width, calculated the, the tooth form and length, waxed them up, did an indirect technique. And, you know, there's lots of people that have these, Spear and others, um, but this is ours. We have a clear matrix material. We do a um, vent holes and there we paint a little bit of monomer in there and roughen the tissues we don't reduce. And then I put the composite in and actually put it in a baggie and put it in a heating pad so it flows ideally. And then we quickly put it in the mouth and we reshape the, the uh, take all the excess off, cure it. And this is what it looks like, polish it up. And basically I did this as an orthodontist, this took me, um, you know, I did it over lunch. It took me a little over an hour to do. And now it's a whole different ball game. This is what we call intermediate uh, restorations and it's invaluable um, to the team. Now we've restored ideal form. And notice I still have the braces on because now that I have the CEJ in the form, I want to fine tune and perfect the dental alveolar components. Then we take it off and polish it up and look how nice that looks. We've taken the emergency out of taking appliances off and trying to get them the restorative care. In fact, we want them to actually go through retention before significant restorative because the only thing worse than getting orthodontic relapse is getting orthodontic relapse after you've spent ten, twenty thousand dollars on aesthetic bonded restorations. And so again, we like to work smarter, not harder. And so this could have lasted for you know 15 years like the last patient, but she um, actually uh, Bob Winter, another friend of mine, decided to use char um, as his model for his DVD series, but treatment time only took eight months. And so here we go. Uh, Bob Winter's doing the restorative now, beautiful. And it's easy, straightforward, minimal reduction, intra-enamel bonding. And again, this is what optimal care is really about, in my opinion. Today, we would do it differently. We would do, we would probably do the, with, the, with the clear aligners, we would do the corticotomies, we would open more volume. But back 15 years ago, this was certainly a case that we could be proud of. And the changes that we make in people's lives, as you can see, here she is 10 years later. And so interdisciplinary orthodontic finishing, what is that? Um, this you can see the, um, a patient with you know, an eating disorder and complicated case because she's got great teeth, except she's already prepped her lingual surfaces with acid erosion and shortened the teeth. Very difficult 
to handle because she's already done her prepping. We want to restore those. And if I open spaces up and then try to finish her occlusion, it's going to close right back down. And the only way to treat this without opening up spaces would be to prophylactically do some endo, and then you'd still severely compromise the integrity of the teeth. And so when you have a, a malocclusion that's not treated, you know, then you have wear and secondary extrusion, you can't restore back proper form. And so what we as a team do, and this is an article we published back in 2009 also, is we quickly overcorrect the alveolo, the dental alveolar components, not only interincisally, but interproximally. And then the restorative dentist comes in and does intermediate restorations to ideal anatomy, to the root form in emergence. And this is not easy to do because we're used to compromising things to the smile and function. We don't want that. We just want ideal tooth form. And then I come back in with the dental alveolar therapy and finalize the occlusion aesthetics. And I have plastic now that I can reshape or easily add to. And so in this case, we really open spaces quickly, interproximally so they can finish better. And you can see Dr. Brad Jones adding indirectly the ideal anatomy to the lingual. And now, in lengthening the incisal edges, now it's an easy case. It's like treating a 13, 14 year old child with virgin teeth. And that's how we try to handle these complex interdisciplinary cases. And so here's the, um, the final alignment. And are we gonna rush her to res restorations? No, we're gonna put her through um, Holly appliances, let things settle in, work out the occlusion. If they're gonna relapse, let them relapse. And then they can do some minor tweaking in a, in a stable relationship when they do the final restorations. If we would not have done this, it would have been a nightmare to try to get them over to the restorative dentist before the case relapsed, okay? If we didn't restore that. And what about younger patients? Take a patient with missing teeth, like this one here, and you know we can align teeth, but when do you feel comfortable doing restorations on a person, okay? And if she's you know, 11, 12 at this time, do you feel comfortable going in and doing veneers? And most of us do not, because if we do you know, those type of restorations now, they're gonna have to be probably replaced when she's in her 20s and probably again in her 40s and again, in her, you know what happens, the sequence. And so this is where less is more. But we also want to realize that the most important time for a patient to feel good about the way they look in their self-image is when those key formative years, the early teenage years. And so instead of saying, well, you're going to wait till you're in your 20s and we're going to do, restore them and, and have to hold them there, we go ahead and come up with creative intermediate restorations. These are what we used to do. We pick the ideal um, denture teeth, hollow them out, we call them denture tooth veneers, as you can see, and um, very inexpensive. We treat them, and we, we minimally polish the teeth and etch, we can bond them in place, we can pound brackets on them. And now again, it's an entirely different ball game for me because I'm not trying to maintain spaces and relationships I can ideally position the teeth. And here she is after we um, have aligned um, the uppers, we're still working on the lowers. So, um, you know, we can take the uppers off and let her start enjoying those too, the upper appliances. And, you know, I think this can definitely make a difference not only in her care, but in her perceived self image through these all important years, making a definitely a difference in the quality of her life. But let's progress this even forward, trying to get more and more modern. Here's 2015, an emergency aesthetic case. This is a young man who, um, um, in high school, very shy um, and introverted, joined the acting class and became a star immediately. Very talented actor, so much so he got accepted for a full ride in New York for uh, acting school. And um, you can see he has attachments on, you know, and so. He said, I'm an Invisalign failure because it, they just didn't work on me. And anytime anybody says that, I know that either they didn't cooperate or somebody didn't know what they were doing. Okay. And so um, he went to the acting school and they said, you've got talent, 
but you need to do something about your teeth. And so somehow he found me in Fayetteville, Arkansas, me and Mike um, Curry, and we're gonna try to restore, um, get him into something better. Now there's no way we can do intermediate restorations right now. We don't wanna do the aesthetic crown lengthening. We don't wanna, you know, um, people have actually suggested he take out his front teeth and do implants. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're gonna break things down. We're gonna measure the teeth the structures, and then we're gonna take this, what we know is Sterrett studies and um, Pascal studies and, and figure out exactly the ideal form. This is a Excel spreadsheet we used at that time with the ideal form, and then what his actual were. And we would look at dimensions, like for instance, the width of his upper canine was in pretty good relationship, although it was um, very um, short. And so we took this and I can plug that in and it calculates what the next, what all the relationships should be and including how much space between each teeth and how much I need to intrude. And so we translate that in digitally into the um, ClinCheck. I still select um, a denture teeth to show the patient. And okay, so now we're doing the aesthetic crown lengthening and Mike is gonna be measuring the teeth to tell me how much uh, I need to reshape uh, how much um, um, length we have, and I can go ahead and re-modify the ClinCheck into the future. We won't get into this too much, but here he is. Look at the difference. And what you have to remember is this is three months post-op, okay? Look at the difference now. <laughs> We've totally changed the environment. Now we can have intermediate restorations done with CAMCAD, uh, much easier, and you can see where he is then and do the, um, uh, there's his restorations, provisional restorations, and we can see that uh, from his smile, um, this he said the happiest day of his life, we're still not finished, but yet it's a very important what we're doing to help these people, okay? We won't go into that right now. But clear aligner therapies are very important in the interdisciplinary process. You take a young lady like this with missing laterals, she's already had treatment once, but now she wants implants, which I've tried to discourage her. I want her to do later on. I, I like um, bonded restorations, especially when it's done with one um, abutment. Uh, but she's set on having implants, but she's not about to go through orthodontics again. And this is where clear aligners, when you know what you're doing, are ideal, especially when you can put tooth card material in there, you know they're going to wear them. And we know that clear aligners are not good at tipping. They're not good at intrusion. They're not good at translation. And so what I'm here to tell you is, is understanding that doesn't mean you can't use them to do those. It means you need to understand and appreciate the limitations and you need to not only overcorrect for those, but what we do is we change the rules. We change the infrastructure through corticotomies and other things to lower the resistance by over 50%. And we can predictably get significant movements that we normally couldn't otherwise get. And so let's go ahead. And here we can see the uh, aligners um, opening, you know, correcting the roots, placing the implants in a very predictable result, um, maintaining her desire for aesthetics during treatment. And so again, this is what the interdisciplinary process is about, but don't let technology fool you into thinking you can do what you, know, the, um, what you can't do. And it's amazing, this is Invisalign headquarters and um, where they have hundreds of young people doing ClinChecks. The major, vast majority of ClinChecks are never even open which you cannot rely on what you get back. You have to modify that yourself to really get predictable results. I spend hours and hours on some of these ClinChecks because they just don't understand. They're not doctors. They don't understand what, what really orthodontics is about or the limitations. If you go down there, you can see there's lots of other things to do too. But let's go ahead and talk a little bit now about what we think the next generation, the future interdisciplinary, you know, it's going to be more, you know, like we said, all the different things. Think alike, common values and goals, seamless collaboration. But it's going to be airway 
focused and it's going to maximize digital technology to you to to make sure the interdisciplinary process can be done efficiently and effectively and when we look at these different um, advantages we have today when you really look at digital it's amazing how many things are all digital now um, and what it's doing to the interdisciplinary process and you know we talk about you know most doctors go by you know fear profit or better patient care and making decisions and i'll be here to tell you that sadly better patient care is is low on the totem pole usually it's about something that can be profit or fear but this is where we can utilize digital technology to do so many different things that to fulfill these and, and do patient better care and so with that let's talk about suzanne and kind of bring it full circle on how we treat these and then i'm going to skip over a few slides and we'll try to get finished so we can have some question and answers um, this is suzanne and uh, you know she comes in um, she doesn't like her smile her face is sunk in um, she's had treatment twice once for tmd um, once for aesthetics and when we look at her let's just kind of go into detail and kind of bring it all full circle again from where we started her chief concern was that she had TMJ problems and doesn't like her smile. Medical history, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, and depression, you know, silent GERD, dental history, routine dental and imperial, really good health, lifelong TMD problems with intermittent therapy, orthodontics twice, once in the 30, once in her 30s, um, with extraction of a lower incisor, and once recently for TMJ problems. Okay. Her current problems, medical, still the same. Fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, mild depression, and silent GERD. Sleep, excessive snoring, wakes four to five times. Bathroom breaks two to three times, wakes unrefreshed. We need to pay attention to this. Her medical counterparts frequently will just gloss over it. TMD, limited opening with pain in left TMD, ringing stuffiness um, in her left um, ear with some pain, traumatic interincisal relationship, posterior displaced condyles with left being worse, and appearance of severe condylar remodeling. Um, she was told by the surgeon she had a left um, displaced disc with bone on bone, and he recommended a total joint replacement. And so again, she's concerned about all those things, but especially her smile. You can see how sunk in she looks. And this is where I think a lot of this is lack of volume. Um, this is where we get her a collaborative chart going, get the team together, make the referrals. Um, and we send her for a sleep study and it comes back that she's got mild um, sleep apnea, totally blew her away. And we start looking at all her lifelong symptoms. She's probably been suffering from this since she was a little girl, okay? And so diagnosis and treatment planning, we talked about you know, the different treatment options for her, um, you know, and all the different things um, that we look at. And ideal, what is that? For, for her, it could be orthodontic surgery. That's the only predictable way to treat health issues like she has, um, you know, with airway. In medicine and dentistry is orthodontic surgery. Um, but if she doesn't want to do that, and that might be overly aggressive, you know, we can do surgically facilitated orthodontic therapy to create more oral volume um, with clear aligners and selective corticotomies. And then conservative restorations where we open up spaces to hold that, that volume. And if she doesn't wanna do that, what are we gonna do? We do conservative TMD therapy and either a CPAP, we're gonna insist on a CPAP or a mandibular advancement appliance to maintain it and continue to try to get her to do options um, two or one. And it's all part of what we call the bigger box theory, and I stole this from Tom Colquitt and Jeff Rouse, is if the oral cavity is a box and the tongue is a balloon, and we try to put the balloon in a box in the oral cavity that's too small, the tongue doesn't change size, but it changes um, shape. It's a hydrostat muscle. And we try to close that, it's gotta go somewhere, and all too sad, it typically goes back into the airway. And so when we know it's an oral pharynx type problem and not a nasal problem, we've nailed it down, we focus on creating a bigger box. 
and then that can house it and open up the airway and significantly change the majority of these patients. And so she's selected to go with the interdisciplinary alternative. We're gonna put her on a CPAP um, just to start, start resolving her symptoms and to motivate her into seeing where we're going when she has a refreshed night's sleep. Then we're gonna tell her, we're gonna try to get you off of the CPAP. We're gonna do conservative therapy to try to recorticate or stabilize your condyles. We're gonna do a trial mandibular advancement appliance at that particular time with a MITAP to see if opening up the oral pharynx does indeed help her to know better if our treatment's gonna work. Um, then we're gonna do surgically facilitated therapy with clear aligners to make more room, okay? And then we're gonna do a very important sleep hygiene and mild functional therapy to get her breathing proper, lips together, tongue in the right spot, swallowing properly, and then long-term maintenance um, as needed. And so here we go. And she still doesn't know whether she wants to go through treatment or not. She goes, God, it's gonna you know, make more room. What's it gonna look like? Am I gonna look better? Is it gonna fill up my lips? And this is where digital technology, again, is so critically important. Um, and we can show her exactly what it's gonna look like. And so um, here we're doing digital smile design to show her what the increased volume is going to be like and we're going to do this get her approval and then retrofit our treatment plan in to do this all creating a bigger oral cavity and you know this is where we can do printed models with the design and do clear aligners and just with the pvs um, clear tooth colored material we can do a motivational mock-up that the patient can try in and then we take photos so we can show her what she's gonna look like with a little bit more incisor exposure, with a fuller upper arch, and fuller lip support and profile, and what her teeth look like when they, we create that more volume, and telling her that our goal is to try to help you health-wise too, not only make you look better. And so then we can actually do a video um, showing and show that to her and so she can see what it looks like during smile, all to get the patient's confidence. And then um, this is, you know, again, a valuable part of the overall process utilizing digital technology. Once she gets the approval, then we can transfer that um, and build it into the ClinCheck. Notice we have to, to create volume, we have to open spaces and we have to leave the posterior teeth as anchorage, okay? We're gonna do the selective corticotomies so that we can move teeth two to three times faster and two to three times further for two to three months. And notice the space and volume increase and the more room for her tongue, which is so important. And then the restorations are gonna be done to maintain those spaces long-term, very conservative, just replacing her first molars and doing some bonding, as you can see here. And then again, notice the volume, the better inner incisor relationship, letting her jaw come forward. And here she is. And she loves her new smile. We do a new sleep study, uh, came back 5.4, which is a radical improvement. She still has minor sleep apnea. And so what do we do? Um, we can go ahead, she needs to wear retainers anyway. And so what we've done is we've reduced how much we need to advance her. So we can put in just a light advancement type of appliance that's also going to maintain the relationship of her teeth with an AM aligner. I find that when we treat the condyles properly, we don't get as much um, uh, relapse or um, a, a bite shift. And that's a whole other talking about that, that we need to do. And so let's just lightly touch on a few other um, so this is how we treat, um, ideally treat these patients today in, in, with the next generation of, of dental facial therapy. Okay, and let's go ahead and I'm gonna get out of here for just a second and I'm gonna have to go ahead, I'm running behind, started talking too much. Just give me one minute and I'll try to finish quickly so we can get, I want to go to two cases to finish everything up. And this is where um, 
the um, believe it or not that um, anthropology has really impacted us. I was hoping we'd get a chance to talk about that, but we're not going to be able to. But the dental anthropology has radically changed the way we look at our patients and we want to be more anthropologically correct. And this is all a modern man type problem. But let's go to Eva. We promised you we'd show her case. This is, she came in um, wanting better um, changes in her face. So here she is at 30 years of age and she doesn't like the sunken look. She goes, I look a lot older than I, than I think I should. Um, really wasn't picking up any symptoms at that time. And I told her the only way we could treat her was to do orthodontic surgery, orthodontics, orthodontic surgery, um, to do a multiple piece maxilla, advance everything, and then in, um, to overcorrect the skeletal components to address her alveoloskeletal problems. And this is a great example of alveoloskeletal problems. Notice how the lower teeth are way far back on a fairly adequate size mandible. And we can't just correct that overbite now, can we? Because that's an alveoloskeletal problem, the relationship of the dentalveolar complex on the skeletal base. And so she goes, no, I'm not interested in that treatment. I've got kids and a career. So she goes, goes away and then comes back 14 years later at 44 and says, I hear you got other options now. And so, yes, we do. And so this is where now we have ways of dealing with the alveoloskeletal problems without having to over-treat the skeletal component. And so look at her intraoral. You can see she's got missing teeth that were taken out. Everything's tipped in. Thin bone. Now, just somebody radical would try to move teeth out on, these, on this thin phenotype because what we'd have is more dehiscence and and probably more clefting of the situation. Look at the severely constricted arches. And so we need to not only create more volume, we need to improve her phenotype. And so this is where we're gonna do optimal space appropriation with interdisciplinary things. And what do we do? We have to show her what it's gonna look like, and this is where we use our, our digital workup and planning that we're gonna to retrofit. Um, where we want to go with the digital technology. We're going to embed that into our clear aligner therapy and so that it makes it much less problematic, much more ideal. And then we can go ahead and look at this and, you know, look at the, and then do the corticotomies. And now we're going to do our plan. And this is after six months. You can see how much volume we've created. And this volume is very important you know, again, for long-term airway health and aesthetics, creating the volume. Now we get the restorative dentist involved and he's gonna help us determine what type of restorations he needs to do and notice the improvement in the overjet. The, not only did we straighten the teeth, but look how much spaces we've opened. And we actually were able to gain eight and a half millimeters um, in the upper. And remember, she had the hissences before. And now we're eight and a half millimeters wider and our tissues actually look healthier with root coverage. And so again, now um, um, Dr. Mike Carter is gonna start being involved. At first, we decide how much space we need, but I place it where I need to for the mechanics to get it. But then the restorative dentist totally takes over and starts dictating where he wants the spaces for the optimal conservative restorations. And we're gonna start reshaping, um, doing enamel plasty. now it's 12 months. He's actually added um, posterior veneers on the, on the canines right here, reshape the front teeth, and I close that to get rid of the black triangles and much more stable. Implants on the lower, we're still fine tuning and tweaking. And so you can see the initial, and then the team gets together, plans with the volume we want, and where it, and I determine where it's going to be. And then the restorative dentist gets in and determines where exactly I need to move spaces in, in refinement to be able to conservatively restore. And you can see what he did. He did enamel plasty. He did porcelain bonded onlays to the distal uh, veneers to the distal conservative onlay veneers on the laterals and 
conservative um, onlays on the molars. Again, this is where we feel the restorations are critically important to maintain the result so it doesn't collapse. And also we feel less is more when it comes to these restorations. Same thing on the lower. We had implant crowns and just um, traditional crowns on the first molars. And so you can see what the progression is intraorally. And then we put it in the smile. So everything is airway focused and aesthetic focused and long-term prognosis focused. And this is where we can make a significant difference in oral volume and airway. And notice the difference, how much far we've moved this teeth would not be possible without understanding and treating the alveoloskeletal components. And we go from there to there and look at the fullness in her lips. She looks much more youthful, more healthy. And, you know, when you ask her if she would do it again, you know, there's no question she would do it again in a heartbeat. Okay. And so it's where you start saying that, that she's, you know, showing her smile. Look at that beautiful smile. And so what I, you know, with the airway focus and digital technology, what I want to ask you is who else in healthcare besides an optimal interdisciplinary team can not only treat major underlying health issues, but make people more beautiful at the same time. That's what we're blessed with, the opportunity. And so let's look now at the last case I'll show and then we'll take questions. And this is Catherine, age 14. Um, you know, you look at her, she's been through treatment, doesn't show enough incisor exposure, want that youthful dynamic. And this is what she was initially. You know, it looks like all we need to do is nice dental alveolar therapy to expand everything a little bit um, and, you know, get the teeth in the right spot. Um, no dental alveolar comp, uh, treatment was done, just some brackets were put on there that kind of blew everything out. And that's why we need to be careful. We can't just do that. You need to know what you're doing. And so this is how she came to me and I was the 13th opinion and she had to go you know, halfway across the country. But these teeth are just flared out and you can see how they're, they're tipped out. And it's amazing these teeth are still vital. Notice the root resorption. They're absolutely totally out of bone in every direction. And th this is where it's interesting to see all the different treatment plans that people um, gave her, all the way from taking out upper premolars and moving things back, which would what? Collapse in her face and possibly set up some airway issues. And remember, I, when I look at patients, I always, they're, to me, they're an airway patient until proven innocent. And then if they're proven innocent, I view them as a patient that will develop airway issues in their lifetime, okay? That radically changes the way you treat patients and the quality of the result. But uh, again, how we, uh, she was told she needed to have these teeth taken out in implants place. She was told she needed orthodontic surgery. And this again is what we need to do is just stop. Let's get down and focus on the fundamental components and just see really what's going on and, and get these fundamental components working back together. But almost in every dimension, these teeth are just out of bone. And so this is where we're going to use digital technology again. Notice, again, the teeth are all out of bone. Um, this is where we can look at it and, and really plan on the, what we need. And in reality, one of the problems is our maxilla is just way too small. It's too narrow. And even the buckle, um, the molars are, are tipped out of bone. And so my focus is going to be creating a much larger maxilla, growing bone and for those teeth to be housed in getting her out of her retention. Instead of holding those teeth out of bone, we're gonna let them relapse into the bone that we're developing and making. And we can simulate how much space we need, how much volume we can do, all with digital technology now. It's absolutely amazing. And we now with skeletal anchorage, we don't wanna do just expansion on her and move the teeth further out of the bone. We're not gonna put any pressure on the teeth. We're just gonna, we're gonna tie into the bone, the palate get absolute anchorage, which is gonna not only increase her maxilla, but significantly increase her nasal cavity. Again, 
leading to better airflow dynamics lifelong. And we're gonna do this, let the teeth relapse better into the bone. Then we're gonna take our information from our digital workup and we're gonna implement it into um, our ClinCheck, okay? And knowing that um, we're gonna try to create more volume, we don't wanna retract. And so with the thing we know, and this is a case um, we didn't get to, but if you look at this case, we wanna grow bone and make things bigger, but this is what it looks like when you flap. This is what it looks like to flap. And so what we did is we did corticotomies and then did this with Invisalign, moving the teeth two to three millimeters more facially. And look at what happened when we went into a, for a phase two surgery. Look at this beautiful bone that we now have. And so we have the knowledge and the scientific evidence to grow bone. We need more scientific evidence. But not only do we have this more robust bone, it's two to three millimeters out more than it was with all these dehiscences. And then, so we're gonna do corticotomies and instead of trying to retract teeth to get the teeth in the bone, I'm gonna grow bone and tip those, those roots facially and get those, those, those apices into better bone and grow more bone, maintain her beautiful lip support and make her more airway proof into the future. And so here she is. Notice this is only a couple months into treatment and notice how much better everything's looking. But look at where she started and this is where she is now, okay? And there's immature bone matrix here. And, and as you'll see that this is gonna get better and better and better. As this case is, um, five months after, you know, there's immature bone matrix here. Look what it looks like 18 months later with beautiful bone. And this is what she's gonna have. It's just gonna get better and better. We're continuing to treat her now to extrude her teeth and give her more incisor exposure, fit everything into her face. We're monitoring her remotely with, with artificial intelligence. This is photographs with her cell phone. We have a special box. This is dental monitoring. They'll actually monitor how our trays are fitting. You, here you can see the elastics we're using. But you can see you know, how much more beautiful a smile she has. We're gonna show more tooth and structure. But look at this beautiful young lady now that thought that she was gonna lose her teeth. And she wouldn't even bite into anything because she thought she would knock them out. So this is where, the, where the, everything comes together with the interdisciplinary approach, especially now with digital technology. We talked about a lot of things, um, you know, but touched on. There's a lot more we can go into. This is the different fundamental skeletal components and the different treatment options that we have that the team utilizes. We briefly touched on some of those. But our goal in the future is not only to treat these severe problems, adult problems, but to also start at birth and anthropologically treat with ethology driven function structure and behavior to prevent these problems from ever happening in the future, improving the quality and quantity of these patients' lives. And we talked about the future of interdisciplinary dentistry, the next generation being airway focused and maximizing digital technology. Well, I'm here to tell you now that the future is now, and we are in a unbelievable position to make a difference, improve and treat major underlying health issues and make people more beautiful at the same time. And what we can do to help these individual patients is truly amazing. And with that, I want to thank you. I rushed through a lot of material. Um, we're also, if you need any more information, you can contact me at Robley, info at robleyortho.com or you know, if you're interested more in the SFOT and other, we have some really popular hands-on courses we're doing now. And you can go to the Airway Collaborative and hear about not only SFOT courses and MSC courses, but also our courses on Airway, the Airway Mini Residency. But with that, I want to thank um, Kenton and Timmy for, for allowing me this time. I'll be glad to open it up for some questions. Hopefully, um, this was useful information.
Yeah, that was absolutely fantastic. I love watching you speak and uh, boy, and you're focused in even uh, since last time we talked. Um, j just before we hit some of the questions, wh where are you doing your seminars or your courses? Uh, are, are those live hands-on courses or what are those? Well, th thank you for asking. And, you know, because this is complicated and, you know, basically what I gave you are, are snippets of what we teach and we really encourage the teams to take these courses together. For several years, we've been doing hands-on courses here in Fayetteville that have been wildly uh, successful um, with the reviews and everything. But with this new um, environment, now we've broken, instead of doing a long hands-on course here we do, in Fayetteville where we do live surgeries, what we do is we're doing um, two um, a three-part a three part series. Two of them are online. We oh. have an introductory course, um, and then we have a techniques course online, and then we still have a live course in Fayetteville um, as part three, where we actually, everybody does, you know, model surgeries. We do live surgeries that they get to watch. We do clin checks. Um, we do restorative treatment planning. Um, it's a lot of fun. And we, people can also uh, you know, do those courses digitally if they want to, but hopefully things will clear up um, so that they can, will come to Fayetteville. But if anybody's interested in that, please go to the Airway Collaborative. We actually have another series starting um, in the next couple of weeks. And we really encourage the entire team to participate so that Monday morning you can go back and start doing it. And Kenton's actually a part of those, of those courses. Yeah. Well, that's terrific. I know I'm going to uh, for sure come and see you guys. Uh, let's get hit some questions. Uh, Dr. Ross, do you want to handle the questions or do you want me to? Uh, sure. Let me pull them up there. We've got quite a few. A few more added on here. So, um, Rick, I know there was one question about uh, on a patient over 60 who'd been on bisphosphonates, uh, whether or not uh, we can do the procedures and if there wasn't specific i think uh, you may want to answer that in two parts one for the sfot and one for the ortho okay you know bisphosphonates is obviously a big big deal now and typically what we do with the with the invisible you know with treatment is first off do no harm and so if they're taking you know bisphosphonates we get them off of them for a while and then we do a little test either by putting a couple brackets on um, or by doing um, some in-house aligners to see if we can get tooth movement or not. Um, now, depending on how much they've been on, whether it's IV or intraoral, may or may not compromise if we can do the corticotomies or not, okay? Because obviously, <laughs> that could be quite a problem if, if, if they are, if, if they're bony, you know, we're depending on you know, increasing bony turnover. And if they're taking bisphosphonates, it would shut that down. It could be a tremendous problem. And, and so um, we really are careful with that. And we, we do a lot of groundwork on that first. Mm -hmm. Good deal. And then uh, in your experience, uh, what are the most commonly misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed conditions? Lack of bone. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. The yeah. biggest problem we deal with is lack of bone. Um, this is a modern man problem. I didn't, I had to skip over my dental anthropology. You look at our ancestors, they got these big, robust uh, maxillas and mandibles with robust alveolar bone. And, you know, and that's why we've taken out teeth and everything, trying to fit the teeth in to this deficient alveolar bone. And it's not a dental problem. The dental problems are symptoms of underlying issues. And, and typically the lack of alveolar bone can be translated into um, functional problems too. And so it gets really complex. So I think that's a major um, problem um, that we deal, have to deal with all the time. And this is where we didn't have a good solution before um, that we really do now. So I think uh, the other issue is, is trying to treat these alveoloskeletal problems, which is a, a modern man dilemma too, with the more normal sized skeletal bones with dentalveolar complexes that are totally out of position. And we couldn't modify that. Um, and so this is where we would either ignore it, over treat other components, like try to do it orthodontically and having iatrogenic tissue loss, 
with soft tissue, hard tissue, or root structure, and certainly having relapse. And now with SFOT and other procedures, we can treat these otherwise undiagnosed and untreatable issues. So it's an exciting time for an interdisciplinary team. And then of course, airway issues. And as a trained nephologist, always part of major part of my practice has been TMD. We're looking now and more and more at a lot of even the TMD symptoms are coming from an airway um, platform. And I think we're gonna see this more and more in the future. Once you see it and feel it, there's no going back, okay? Good deal. Yeah, so a couple of questions on how you uh, prevent relapse, how long you have to hold in place, and uh, maybe we maybe speak to a little bit of how SFOT affects relapse. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, just like, you know, we can't just move teeth and expect it to stay. So a couple different things. Number one, um, we're not just using cell-mediated tooth movement to move the teeth through deficient tissues and then hoping it's going to stay. We're actually changing the infrastructure and creating a more ideal, robust infrastructure, which is obviously gonna be more stable. We still hold it to let it mature, but we still also have to go ahead and treat the soft tissue dysfunction that probably was the reason why they had that development issues in the, in the past too. We can't just structurally change something and expect it to stay there. We have to change the soft tissue and create the proper equilibrium. Okay, so they know how to use it. Good deal. Uh, let's scroll down here. Uh, what uh, criteria do you consider to decide if coracotomy is required for anterior intrusion? Well, for, especially if we're using Invisalign, you know, intruding, um, number one, in, intrusion is a, a fairly unstable um, thing. If you intrude, you're gonna lose 30 to 50% with, with normal treatment. Um, Invisalign is not, or clear aligners are not very effective at, at allowing, um, at performing intrusion or translation. So what we do with the cord economies, we demineralize the bone in resistance by over 50%, making it where Invisalign now is actually the treatment of choice, especially when compounded with skeletal anchorage. So when we have major or significant intrusion, Invisalign is my treatment of joint with corticotomies to allow the movement and just as important to reform the infrastructure to create a more stable relationship. Does that answer the question? I think so. Mm -hmm. So there's a question here on the timing. As far, the question is how soon um, ortho treatment starts after the corticotomy. Uh, the ortho question, treatment, that's a great question. <laughs> ortho treatment starts before yeah. Because we only have two to three months to take advantage of it. And we do the corticotomies in the orthodontic treatment at the time to most ideally treat the biggest concern. And so if we're trying to grow bone because we're crowding, we're going to get them started and do the corticotomies early on. If we're trying to open spaces or intrude or expand, we're gonna do some normal alignment, correct rotations, then do corticotomies, because we only have two to three months to do that significant move. So each case is totally different um, than the ones before, okay? Um, and and it, it's, each one's unique. And where we do the corticotomies, whether it's facial, usually we don't do corticotomies on the second molars because that's our anchorage. So we build in, by not doing corticotomies, that's our anchorage. And so again, it's, it's very highly, um, uh, scientific and you know it, it's unique and it's a lot of fun every, every case is a jigsaw puzzle and Kenton you yeah. certainly know that you sit through. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have to figure that timing out but so many opportunities you got a few yeah. more tools to work with uh, Kevin Boyd would like you to please pr uh, briefly describe what you meant by your statement about how anthropology could be utilized to help inform our diagnostic and treatment planning decisions Kevin Boyd, he's a good fashion, <laughs> he's an old fashioned good friend. And I know where he's going. And I'm, Kevin, I'm sorry, hope I didn't disappoint you too much. I had to skip over the anthropological section. And what, what we're referring to is these, all these problems we're talking about did not exist in our ancestors. Where 70% of modern man has a malocclusion, 5% of our ancestors did before um, agriculture and especially before industrialization. Um, 
you know, so only 5% of our ancestors had malocclusions, unless they were in a diseased population or malnourished, then they started having more malocclusions like us. But the other point you need to understand is that our, ancestors, our dental anthropologists like Dr. Unger and Dr. Rose utilize third molars to determine if there's a malocclusion. And so that's 5% of these patients have a malocclusion, and that includes third molars. If you included that in modern man, it'd be 90, 95%. And so what we're doing now is we're using these standards. When, when you have these deficiencies, it certainly is a significant influence on TMD, airway, and certainly um, other problems. Um, and so from birth, now, instead of letting these problems occur, we're trying to treat as early as possible to give mother nature her chance to grow the structures like they should be to begin with, instead of us having to work all these heroics. And certainly Kevin Boyd is a huge leader in that. And he's done some amazing things. And what's fun is he considers a seven year old patient, which is when most orthodontists think that we should see the patient for the first time. In his practice, orthodontically, he considers that a geriatric patient because we've already missed the majority of our opportunity of changing growth and development. And so uh, that's something we really hit hard and big in um, our courses for sure. Thank you, Kevin, for bringing that point up. All right, Dr. Ross, uh, cherry pick one last question here. We're running out of time, I'm sorry. Okay, well, I think it's key to, to the question is, do you move the teeth buccally to build bone? And I think it was very important to clarify how we get that bone in the buckle of those teeth. Yeah, the, um, what we're doing is, you know, and people say we can't, we can't do that, that we don't have the research, uh, and we're right. We need more research to show that we are truly growing bone. But what I can tell you, and you've seen in, in all these cases, is that we're moving teeth out buckley two, three more millimeters, and we're improving the periodontal phenotype. And when we go back in and flap, we're seeing more bone. And so what we're doing is, is we're combining the body's reparative process, um, trying to, you know, thinking it's been injured with the corticotomy, adding the grafting material, setting up a, a, almost a fourfold bony turnover, rejuvenating the entire arch and we feel growing more hard and soft tissue okay and so that's a really important part um, of, of, of what we're doing and we're trying to get more and more research of that but by growing bone moving teeth more buckly into it we're treating the real underlying problems okay well Beautiful. I, I think we'll have to stop there because our next speaker, Dr. James Metz, is on deck here. So we've got to get him set up. Uh, really want to thank you, Dr. Robley, for doing this. Uh, thank you for skipping your haircut this morning. Appreciate it. <laughs> time uh, uh, thank you, Timmy. And, and you guys are in for a real treat with Dr. Metz. He's another friend and mentor. Um, and so um, we'll talk a we can talk a lot more about that some other time, but um, and good luck to, to everybody with um, Dr. Metz. Thank you so All much. All right. Thank yeah, you thanks, very Rick. much. We appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Ross, for your you first bet. speaker. Thanks, uh, Dr. Dr. Ross. A reminder, this is a Washington AGD Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE series that's being brought to you. If you missed part of a webinar or you want to review a webinar, go to uh, WashingtonAGD.org and just click on the YouTube link. That'll take you to our YouTube channel and you'll have the ability to review the past 38 uh, webinars that are there. We're going to leave those up for a couple of weeks here during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. The, and uh, well, we're still off work here in Washington State till May 18th. want to thank our partners, University of Washington School of Dentistry CE. For those of you that were late onto the webinar, you will be receiving your CE credit via the University of Washington School of Dentistry it will come in a PDF format. It's not personalized that CE credit. Just put your name on it, save it for your records. Those of you that are AGD members, we will report your uh, CE to uh, the AGD and those uh, 
CE credit should show up on your transcript within the next two to four weeks. We'd like to thank the Canadian Academy of Restorative Dentistry and Prosthodontics for keeping us in touch with everybody up in Canada. Uh, we'd like to thank Comet USA, Patterson Dental, Pierce County Dental Society, Snohomish County Dental Society, and Seattle King County Dental Society. Please take a look at the flyers that are still going by there. And if there's something of interest, use the QR code or go to WashingtonAGD.org uh, to sign up for those webinars. With that, uh, on behalf of the Washington Academy of General Dentistry, Stay Home, Stay Healthy CE Series, want to say thank you for joining us. And we'll see you at noon with Dr. Metz. All right. Thank you, everyone. We're going to stop broadcasting here and take care. Dr. Ross, we'll yes, see sir. you in just a couple of minutes on the next one. So stay on here or log back in. Log back in using okay. the other link. Thank you, sir. What a, thanks. See you.